right, so I'm Matt Williams. I also work for Chimp. Um, I've been working for Chimp less than probably uh, coming up, coming up in three weeks, maybe a month now. And this is kind of my um, entering the, the the world of full time Ruby on Rails, and I can't even quite call it a job because compared to where it was, it doesn't feel like a job. And I don't have anything kind of extraordinary to talk about or technical or new release, but I kind of want to tell you about working in a corporate environment like a uh, Fortune 50 company, corporation, and how I kind of made do with what I had and made the most of it and how I kind of made this transition to where I am now and a uh, much happier person. So here we go. So working for a corporation is, is very, very difficult and not necessarily difficult in terms of the job duties, but difficult of what they give you. So. You know, as I progressively got more and more involved in the Rails community, I started noticing the constraints I had more and more. For example, um, software, hardware, uh, various corporate procedures, corporate processes, and, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, so the first thing you have to do is kind of find your way around them. And not necessarily, you know, bad ways, but enough where it might, it's kind of borderline, you know, you might be breaking the rules, but it's all for the better. And you can always ask for forgiveness later, so I think that's pretty, pretty common. So this may or may not be the scenario I was stuck with. Um, I had to work on Windows. Um, there were some Solaris and Linux boxes kind of spread out, although they belong to different groups and different people administer them and you kind of had to know people and it, it's a kind of a very weird, um, I don't know, kind of a weird network of things of, of other people in the corporation who are also trying to do bigger and better things than what you're allowed to do. So you kind of have this underground, almost like prison-like, you know, behind the scenes, you know, behind IT's back uh, way of doing things. Um, everything's really locked down, especially when you were working in the type of work I was doing which doesn't need explanation. Um, we had one choice of SCM. Uh, it wasn't CVS, it wasn't Subversion, it wasn't Git, it wasn't any of the other distributed systems. There was a system uh, run by IBM who they bought out. Clear case. <laughs> yeah. Um, there was one choice of, for issue tracking, which uh, if you have clear case, then you also have uh, clear quest, if you're familiar, and equally as bad. <laughs> uh, let's see, the, the language uh, that was a standard uh, kind of work for my group was Cold Fusion, and it wasn't even like latest Cold Fusion, it was like years of gold Cold Fusion that we kind of got and picked up and just kind of built stuff with, and we're working with Oracle. So kind of hurdles along the way, and, and, and needless to say, um, like I said, as I got more involved with the Rails community, what I was working with um, when I first started this job, eh, this stuff isn't too bad. Cold Fusion's really easy, whatever, and it talks to Oracle really easily and whatever. Um, but as I got more into Rails and more into the community, I wanted to start bringing this into my, into my career. So you kind of had to figure out how to exploit what I had available. Um, so luckily, because of a certain position I was in, I had admin rights on my machine, which not everybody has, so I was actually able to install my own software. Um, despite there being a full like three month long process to get a piece of software approved and installed on your computer by IT. Um, however, we had very poor IT oversight, so I could install whatever I wanted and they wouldn't detect it because they were pretty much just kind of scanning very, you know, straightforward directories and, you know, I had coworkers for kicks that, you know, put like a napster.exe in the root directory of their C drive and they never got, you know, flagged or anything like that just to, um, give you an idea. And um, I also had some free time, but not necessarily free time, like I wasn't always busy. But um, I, needed a, I needed a good project, and I needed a project to make all this stuff work so I could sell it. So I could actually go to my manager and say, look what I did with this set of tools that cost me absolutely nothing. Um, the, you know, the support for the tools cost nothing. I did it 10 times faster. You know, the, the productivity, and not only that, but the maintenance on the tool is, is, is this much, you know, better compared to um, what's there. Um, so the tools that make this very easy, um, NetBeans and JRuby. Uh, how many people here raise their hands have used NetBeans? 
Okay, so a couple of people. So a couple of people when they first hear NetBeans and they think IDE and they're kind of very, very against it, and you know, without you know, without actually playing with it. And as of NetBeans 6.0, they've had really, really amazing support for Ruby. Um, there's a really good debugger. They have a really good test runner. Um, and, and basically, I mean, you can you can mock it to look like Net or TextMate very easily. And it's got you know all sorts of fancy auto completion. And pretty much, if you're working in Windows, it's 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 like probably one of the nicest editors you can get for Ruby. And you know, basically, I would use it for an editor, and then I would use Sigwin for uh, you know console command line stuff, which uh, worked out really well. Um, What's that? Yeah, actually, yeah, you can have uh, you know auto test running, and then it'll in real time show you your code coverage as you're editing. So you can you don't have it's 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 pretty unbelievable the features they're adding, and they're adding them very quickly. And um, they also address issues and bugs very very quickly, which I'll touch on. Um, so as far as the need for Ruby Rails and testing, it was all in NetBeans, and because we're a Java shop actually getting NetBeans wasn't that big of a deal. So yeah, I could go download NetBeans, install it, but I could also put a request in and say, hey, this is a really important tool that I need, blah, 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 blah. They wouldn't say, you know, they, they, you know, they wouldn't question it. They would say, yeah, yeah, we know NetBeans, opposed to me requesting something, you know, like you know, the Ruby programming language itself or something else, whereas the beauty of JRuby is it's just a jar file. And so it's kind of awesome now that we can kind of slide in Ruby wherever I need it. Um, I need a better database. I don't know if anybody's worked with Oracle with Rails, but it's not the most pleasurable experience. Um, there are, there is really good support. So using the Active Record JDBC libraries for Oracle, it's not bad, but it's not the greatest either. And uh, I guess Oracle lacks a lot of. Uh, um, features that you'd find in uh, in Postgres that just make life a lot easier, and plus, uh, kind of the standards for um, what we're using in terms of database convention didn't match up to what Rails was using at all, and I had very limited admin access, so um, it was very convenient that a box came into my hands that had a Postgres server running on it for another tool. So I kind of piggybacked on that database, and things worked out very well. Um, as I progressed through this kind of transition, people were becoming more open-minded into other suggestions because lots of people were complaining about ClearCase. And so bringing Subversion and getting Subversion installed wasn't actually that big of a deal. Um, but as far as issue tracking, that was kind of still an issue. Um, but then comes in Redmine. And I don't know if anybody's used Redmine, but Redmine is probably one of the most incredible open source Ruby on Rails projects. And it's a, it's a, a full issue tracking system with full SEM integration. Uh, wiki support, file management, uh, they, they do a lot. And so it, it's actually probably better than lots of the hosted solutions. Um, and so I was just able to spin up an instance of that. And not only was I using this for my projects, but some other projects were using it just for basic issue tracking and Gantt charts and stuff just because it's a whole lot easier to use than like project or uh, some of the rational tools. And then lastly, to, to kind of host these, this application, um, I just needed a machine that was never going to turn off, and I had that Postgres box. So I was kind of hosting the, uh, everything on this one Postgres box. That was kind of in a serverish room. Basically, it wasn't getting touched, and no one else was going to kind of realize it was there, except for the people that needed to know. Oh, 20% low battery. Let's see if I can continue here. This is very cool, by the way, the keynote controller for iPhone. So all of that, Instant Rails Toolkit. And it's, you can spin it up in like 20 minutes after you download all the tools. And you're instantly running Rails applications, you're running your tests, and uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very beautiful thing. Um, so immediately I started you know, getting the requirements and everything I needed to do. I was constantly, you know, I kind of brought my manager into the mix as things started progressing and I actually had stuff to show that meant something and not that I was just kind of wasting time. Um, so I did that by uh, first porting an existing application that was a Cold Fusion application and the port to Rails was like three days and it was so much more maintainable. Um, the URL structures were a lot more readable um, and countless other reasons. Um, I took a lot of criticism um, not necessarily I took a lot of criticism, but there's a lot of criticism in terms of um, people not necessarily wanting to change. Um, but I 
didn't necessarily say, okay, I'll go back to Cold Fusion. It was kind of, I kept drilling into it and drilling into it and drilling into it and broadening it, bringing it up whenever I could to kind of expose this more and, for, more, and more, you know, trying to get it to click in other people's heads. Um, and again, I just kept on showing off productivity. Um, but then also, I also started kind of legitimizing all this stuff. So all the paperwork and stuff you need to do and, and forms you need to submit to get software approval, I was actually going through the process. So in the end, when I actually had a product, I could actually show it off to people without the worry of, well, how, how did you do this, or where are you hosting this on, or you know, what, what tools did you build this with? So, and actually, as I started going along the process, paperwork was processed, and IT would come along and install NetBeans, and so as I get the heads up that the IT guy's coming, I'm uninstalling NetBeans and making backups of stuff, that way when he shows up, and you know, you know, he asked me to step aside so he can install the software, this very technical thing on my computer, uh, because the software engineer can't do it himself. Uh, you know, things kind of looked right. So the result, um, I was a much happier person uh, in my job because I was starting to do, I was kind of bringing my hobby into my work life, into my career. Um, I was working with tools I didn't dread working with in terms of especially, um, I didn't necessarily like working with Oracle. Um, I didn't necessarily like working with Cold Fusion, and so kind of bringing Rails into all that was really good. Um, I did gain interest from others. Um, uh, coworkers' interest, uh, enough interest that brought a coworker to Access Conference last year uh, and this year. Um, and also, I was able to make lots of contributions back to the community. So, as you can imagine, actually, there's probably more than you would think, but there probably aren't that many Windows users using uh, the Active Record JDBC driver for Oracle. And so, as I was using this and, and just hitting all sorts of different uh, situations and scenarios, I was creating tickets left and right, and they were being addressed left and right. Um, Nick Seeger is a, is a machine. It was like, as soon as I could get a ticket in there, there was like another point release with it fixed, and, and I would take this back to, to work and talk to about people, because you know, there's software packages that were paying hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in support, and if we ever submitted a ticket, it's this three months, six months process to even establish if the ticket's worth fixing. And so the, it was kind of um, exposing open source to a group that necessarily um, hadn't embraced open source. And so also the same goes for NetBeans. I, I submitted countless issues and bugs to NetBeans and, and they've always followed up with emails and they always send me emails whenever those fixes made a new release, um, which I thought was a very great thing. Um, so what was next? I, I left that job. So along the lines of Nathaniel's talk and kind of fear, um, I probably could have left much earlier into the Rails world, but I guess there kind of was this fear of, you know, can I hack it and I have a wife and a family and a house and a mortgage and pet bills and, and, and all that stuff floats in the back of your head. And it's, it's really an intimidating thought to think, okay, I have an extremely cush job that's probably not in any risk in the next 10 years. Do I really make this endeavor and, and kind of head out? And being able to do what I did in terms of making the best of what I had of the tools and the hardware and we're actually working with Rails more and more and getting more familiar and kind of doing some more stuff at home, it really built that confidence and uh, built the confidence enough where I was able to start looking at job boards and then start investigating um, uh, my you know, contacts and stuff. And, and that's probably the greatest thing is, is to be able to network and get involved with the community in terms of um, Orlando has a really good tech community here and I live about an hour away. So coming out to all the bar camps is no issue. Coming out to the Ruby user group meetings is no issue. Um, Linux user group issue. You know, it's it's all it's great, and it's uh, you meet a lot of people, and that's how I happened to meet Anthony, who brought me on the Chimp team, and it just so happened that Anthony lives like five miles away, and had I not kind of made this leap and, and got involved in the community and stuff, I would have never known that there's another Rails developer working for a startup full time five miles away from my house, and. As it, you know, because I networked and because I got involved, I'm now, it, like I said, I don't feel like I have a job. And so making myself part of the community really, really put me where I am now. And it's a, and it's a very great thing. And, and lots of people that I talked to when I kind of made this transition were very, you know, oh, economy's bad right now. Is this, are you sure you want, this is something you want to do right now? 
and you know they were kind of baffled that you know I wasn't hesitating at all. It was you know I, you know I wanted to you know almost get out as soon as I could once I finally overcame that fear, and uh, that's something I certainly don't regret. And so I kind of got that dream job that I can't even really call a job because it's 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 literally felt like a hobby. And I'm sure everybody here that works Rails full time works does something Ruby related full time um, can say the same thing. You know why. Why work in this kind of environment if you're not enjoying yourself and it's not pleasurable? Um, and for the longest time, I kind of talked that way. And you know, meanwhile, I was sitting in my cubicle, you know, hanging my head some of the time. And I can't necessarily say I didn't like my job, but it wasn't ideal. And and I think RubyCon for me was the tipping point. So all throughout my career, I've been kind of looking out the window at all these people having fun with their Ruby and their Rails, and, and I'm going back to my Oracle, my Cold Fusion, and then I went to RubyConf, and RubyConf really nailed it in, and I saw and, and talked to so many people that were so happy and working on all these projects, and I got back to my desk that Monday morning following, and it was like, not necessarily a walk of shame, but it was like, all right, I've, I've got to do something, and, and that's why I started, uh, you know, doing what I did, and I think that's it. So yeah, do stuff that makes you happy. And I think there's, you know, everything that Nathaniel said earlier, you kind of drilled it down, and, and this is probably said a million times at every different conference and stuff, so it's, it's, but it can't be said enough. So I think that's it. Thank you.